Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Malchila, and uh, thank you all colleagues uh, at UNISA for affording me this opportunity uh, to uh, speak about what is my passion, uh, the issue of language, uh, both in teaching and learning environments, as well as in research. Um, um, so I will briefly um, indicate the, the outline uh, through which I will present this presentation. Uh, first will be a brief background uh, on why we are having the conversation that we are having now. And then uh, briefly make pointers also uh, to the, the relationship between language and learning as well as a look at language and indigenous knowledge research. Uh, I will base that mostly on my experience in, uh, in KwaZulu-Natal, uh, my work uh, with a community there. And then I will propose what I think uh, could be a helpful framework uh, when we are doing research among indigenous people. And uh, lastly, look at uh, the question of sustainability. How can we ensure the sustainability of uh, indigenous languages uh, if we, we really would uh, like to, to have them uh, as part of our education and research systems? So, in terms of background, uh, I will base uh, my background just in, in, in terms of uh, looking at the colonial history that has shaped most of uh, our countries on the African continent and also what has made this conversation necessary. It's not possible for us to think about how we can reimagine indigenous knowledge uh, epistemologies uh, without looking at how, in the first place, uh, indigenous peoples have uh, been uh, robbed, if I may say, uh, of their knowledges, of their languages uh, over centuries. So I, I uh, use the, the work of uh, uh, Bruham, who is a Somalian uh, psychologist, uh, to just to provide a, a brief background, uh, which is uh, what we are all familiar with, the issue of colonialism and also the issue of coloniality. So uh, colonialism as we know it uh, is the political and economic, uh, and economic uh, way in which uh, indigenous peoples have been dominated and exploited. Uh, by others, so it's it's mostly at a colonial, at a sorry, a political and economic levels. So issues of governance, uh, land dispossession, and people now forced from their um, uh, familiar ways of uh, sustaining themselves and being forced into a, into another like. A, when they have been dispossessed uh, from their lands. A, Many of them have been pushed into urban areas, and now we have uh, all these informal settlements and 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 so on. Uh, it's not because uh, light e life is generally brighter in the cities, but it's because of dispossession. So that is colonialism at at that level. But when we look at coloniality, we are looking at a more subtle um, situation where there is an enduring pattern of power uh, which permeates into people's ways of thinking and behaving. And so even after colonialism has ended, we still find that uh, coloniality still continues. It, it's, it's very pervasive. And what are some of the forms uh, of, of that? Uh, it, it's invalidating of, of the core of uh, 
what makes indigenous peoples and marginalizing them, uh, e, 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 making them look like they are they are not worth living. Uh, they don't have rights. They don't have uh, their own experiences are not valid enough. And uh, we have seen that in terms of uh, history, the history that we learned, those of um, us who might have uh, gone to school at the same time as I did, history was about the failure and the conquering of uh, colonial powers, and there was hardly anything in history that showed uh, indigenous peoples. And the same with uh, their own values, the same with religion. So life now becomes a life of looking up to the colonial master as setting the standards. And that is where the issue of language also comes through because uh, the, uh, our own languages now become uh, invalid. They are not, they are not useful. Uh, and when we look at even this conversation that we are having now, it's almost like we cannot have it in Isizulu. We can't have it in in Spedi because that would not meet the globalization standards. We have to use English or we have to use French or other more dominant languages to give the conversation a global outlook. But that is definitely part of the evidence of a uh, coloniality. And so when we look at it from that perspective, we find that coloniality becomes not just the occupation of the land and the expropriation of resources, but it's now occupation of the core of the individual. Uh, the, the, it becomes a, the colonization of what makes a, me as a, an indigenous person. Um, so that is where our conversation starts from, where there has been decimation of languages in some spaces and where the languages still exist. They are not, they, they are not considered academic. They are not considered important enough to push us forward in a way life is formulated by those that have been our masters. Uh, a desire for 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 life to go. Um, so why why then should we have these conversations? Uh, it's because uh, we need to be continually thinking about uh, social political uh, political justice. Uh, because when you look at research, when you look at uh, education, uh, much of it has been uh, based on assumptions. Uh, that uh, Western knowledge or the knowledge of whoever is is colonized the other uh, is more important than that of the indigenous. So uh, everything that we have been doing is according to Western patterns, for for instance, and uh, not necessarily according to to our own patterns. And uh, we need also to counter the in the knowledge monopoly. Uh, where everything that is right, every, everything that is pure and uh, useful and relevant uh, must come from the colonial master. Uh, so looking back at my own years at school, especially the early years of schooling, uh, there was nothing that uh, we were doing at home that was included um, that was uh, included in our um, uh, in our uh, in our curriculum. So everything that we were learning at school uh, came from the West. Uh, and I will show a few examples as we go on. Uh, so we also are having this conversation because we 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 want. Uh, enhanced learning or improved learning opportunities for indigenous students uh, so so that what they learn uh, makes them feel that they are valid that they are humans who are worth being on this earth uh, 
and uh, being with to be in that classroom where they are learning so that they are not as uh, alienated as uh, they feel now. And it's also for ethical reasons uh, because much of the research and education uh, does dismiss uh, indigenous knowledges and indigenous peoples and uh, it's not always ethical in the way in which it is framed. So we need to be thinking about why we are having these conversations uh, from that level. So um, I will draw from my own schooling experiences and this may found familiar to uh, people of my age. Uh, uh, this little, um, what do we call these? Uh, so this rhyme is was in my grade two textbook, uh, my the English textbook, and um, my my children often uh, talk about my memory, which is almost photographic. You know, from my early years, I remember a lot of things that happened. I was preparing. I thought of this uh, poem. Uh, this little rhyme where little Jay Corner sat in a corner eating a Christmas pie, he put in his thumb and pulled up a plum and said, what a good boy am I. So this is meant for me as a kid born and bred in the rural area. The, the word that is familiar there is eating, of course, and probably sitting in a corner, but uh, usually many of our dwellings were around uh, not necessarily have corners. And Christmas, yes, that's where we knew there was Christmas and there was something to celebrate, but a Christmas pie, I had no clue what that is. Um, and when he put his thumb into the Christmas pie, he pulled out a plum. I don't know what a plum is, uh, but this is my grade two learning experience. And uh, it doesn't end there. I also draw from another colleague's example. So in their biology lessons and in the textbooks that they used, uh, they are learning about reproduction. And uh, the example in the textbook, which illustrates how small uh, female ovaries are, uh, says ovaries are the size of an almond. And again, I've never seen almonds. I don't know what almonds look like. So I will never be able to picture the size of an ovary, uh, not because I'm not intelligent, but because I don't know what almonds are. And there are many other examples that we can draw on from, uh, for those uh, who are from backgrounds like mine, were examples that made things much more complicated that, than they are supposed to be because um, the learning that is used does not take into account that uh, uh, students don't speak the language that is being used. Uh, so if, if learning or learning depends on the medium that is used, uh, then it means we need to understand the language that is also used for us to learn. And in the case of Little Jack Orna, or in the uh, case of ovaries being the size of uh, almonds, uh, how much learning was mediated there, uh, we can uh, think that for ourselves and how relevant would that be, that kind of learning be for indigenous students? Uh, that would also be a, a question which makes me feel I was excluded right from foundation phase. Uh, yeah, they, there wasn't much that was in place at that time, at least not at that time, uh, to include me in the learning process. So my whole learning experience becomes an ability to decipher uh, you know, everything that is written almost in code be, because it's not familiar uh, to my own environment. It, when we look at uh, the current situation, I, I got this extract from uh, 
the National Planning Commission. And when they look at education and training, the ideals that they are looking at is, a, you know, when we achieve good education and training, we will be able to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality. And a, that will become the foundation of an equal society. But the question is, if the students' experiences, their lived experiences in the classroom, are experiences of exclusion on the basis of language, how are we going to achieve elimination of poverty? How are we going to achieve an equal society? Because what we are learning already, uh, it might be the same content, but it's not received in the same way for one who is a first language speaker uh, um, of English or whatever that language of instruction is, and for the other who is not uh, the uh, who is not a, a first language speaker of that language. So the question that comes to me is an academic who is also managed to. Uh, uh, go against all these odds, how can I use my academic privilege to mediate meaningful learning uh, for my own students? And how can I use my own experiences to inform the need for change? Uh, do I just continue as if everything is normal or I try to mediate meaningful learning for my own students and I'm mindful in my own teaching that I'm some of the students that I am teaching a, only encountered this language of instruction a, only at school. A, um, and is there space even for indigenous language? In, in my teaching plans, a, there are strategies that a, some researchers in language have a, put across a, on how that can be done even at university level. So is, do I give space at all for students to express themselves um, uh, in indigenous language? And uh, the, the ultimate question becomes, am I educating for sustainability? Because sometimes we want to think of uh, all these problems as all structural, and as if as individuals, we may not necessarily have the, the agency uh, to, to, to change the situation. So at an individual uh, level, as an academic, I may want to continually ask myself these questions when I'm preparing to teach, when I'm uh, preparing for, for, for my students. And as we think about language and learning further, I, I draw from science education firstly because it is my uh, uh, background and also because it is science that has uh, shown the greatest exclusion uh, for indigenous students. And across the globe, uh, there is an outcry for a lack of relevance, uh, uh, of science to the lives of indigenous people and uh, the struggles with the language of science. So I'm, I'm presenting this, making you know, uh, two premises that uh, if in science education, learning the language of science is a, is a major part of uh, learning science, then every science lesson uh, becomes a, a language lesson. And uh, uh, the second would be uh, if language is a major barrier, or actually probably the major barrier, uh, then we, we need to do something about uh, the issue of language, uh, particularly when we, when we look at uh, indigenous students. Because According to Wellington and, uh, and Obson, who have done a, a, a huge amount of work also in science education uh, regarding the issue of language, uh, almost all that we customarily call knowledge is actually language. When we look at uh, 
a history, for instance, if you don't know the right historical terms, you might not be able to express yourself the right way. Uh, in biology, the same thing uh, happens. So it means we need to take almost every lesson uh, or every lecture, if we call it that, or every learning opportunity, almost as a language opportunity, where we are mediating the knowledge using the right form of language and thinking about the students, uh, particularly those for whom the language of instruction is not uh, is not um, the 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 language of the, is not necessarily the language of their thought process. Uh, this is uh, an issue of uh, epistemic justice. Uh, and we know from uh, educational psychology also that there is a connection between language and thought. And uh, we process uh, our thinking in a language. Uh, we may not know which language that is. Uh, at, at a power maybe national power level, at a curriculum level, at a political level, the decision of the language of teaching is taken by those uh, in positions of power. Uh, they decide uh, now uh, the language of uh, teaching is Africans, or now the language of teaching is English, or now it has changed to perhaps another language. But they, there is uh, something that they they are not necessarily thinking, thinking about. Um, this picture is from, um, is taken from my research in uh, KwaZulu-Natal. And uh, I had given uh, the students a task to do. And I just then wondered at the end of the research process, I didn't think about it when I was taking the picture, but at the end of the research process, I thought about whether their thinking was, whether they were thinking in Isizulu or thinking in English as they were doing that uh, that writing task. Because many of them uh, wrote it in English, uh, and we'll say more as uh, as we go. But uh, the point that I'm trying to drive at is uh, is that we need to be thinking whether the language of learning is the same as the language of teaching. Because we said uh, the language of teaching is determined at a political level and at a curriculum planning level. But is it the same language that the students are learning in? If it's not, how do we know what language the students are thinking in? And who should decide what language of learning should be? Is it the student or is it the curriculum planners? And a, a powerful illustration of uh, that, I, I hope uh, some of you have had a look at this, uh, a powerful il illustration of the issue of language and thinking, language of uh, thought um, and language of learning is uh, based on the work of uh, Dr. the late Dr. Neville Alexander. Uh, and it's, it's on YouTube. You can uh, look at Sink or Swim and you will be able to, to see how he powerfully illustrates the, what we constantly as indigenous peoples go through when a, teaching is happening in a, in, a, in a language that is not your own and you spend all the time trying to translate uh, the question into something that you understand and back translate uh, your thought now into an answer that you have to give to the teacher and how much time that takes. And in the end, when we look at um, uh, even looking at awards that we give at university, we are awarding excellence. And who are the excellent students? If we look at uh, you know, the number of awards that we have given, mostly it's students who, uh, whose home language is not a, an, an, indigenous, a, an indigenous language because they already have the uh, advantage of 
being taught in their own language. So, so they don't have to process information uh, for such long periods of time as indigenous people uh, uh, do. Uh, and continuing on, on that issue of uh, epistemic justice, uh, in, indigenous languages are not normally uh, recognized as languages of learning and uh, not as academic languages. So uh, we can't be speaking accounts uh, or discussing accounts in SPED. Uh, that, that cannot happen. We can't be uh, discussing uh, biology in, in Isizulu, uh, but they, there is some work here in South Africa that shows that when students use their own languages in learning, uh, they, 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 they actually understand better, they actually express themselves better, they process information better. Uh, and uh, so there is uh, hope that we could use uh, indigenous languages in teaching and learning situations uh, or at least recognize their existence in our teaching and learning situations because language and identity cannot be separated. So when we acknowledge indigenous languages, we are also acknowledging indigenous identities. We are uh, not saying everyone is English or we are not saying everyone is a uh, French or Africans, we we indigenous peoples. Um, so it is from such academic use that indigenous languages could see their preservation. Uh, when we we acknowledge students' uh, uh, languages of thought and learning we are likely to make them use those languages more and they are likely to achieve more and they are likely to understand more and they will probably also excel and, um, um, and get the opportunities that other students, their counterparts who are non-Indigenous uh, are currently getting. So there is definitely a lot for us to reimagine uh, particularly uh, when we look at uh, the amount of gatekeeping uh, that is happening uh, in our uh, spaces, both in terms of research and researchers. And uh, there are a lot of philosophical questions that are asked around the issue of language and knowledge and uh, other things. And most of these questions are actually used to disqualify indigenous knowledges as not valid, uh, as not uh, constituting knowledge, um, uh, because questions like who qualifies as a knower, uh, you know, what qualifies you to be a knower, what qualifies as knowledge, we, we begin to focus uh, perhaps uh, on, uh, you know, if we, if we look at the example that um, I think it was Charles Dickens, uh, you know, where a student, a teacher was asking a student to define a horse, you know, but this student was um, working with horses, knew horses very well, but just couldn't define it. Uh, so we, we are getting ourselves in terms of the philosophical questions, getting ourselves uh, almost uh, brought down uh, by such questions because we are now having to defend whether indigenous knowledge is knowledge at all. Uh, if it's knowledge, why is it to be labeled as indigenous and not just qualify immediately as, uh, as knowledge and it gets the validity of that knowledge gets measured in Western terms and not in, in indigenous terms. So, so all those questions, uh, I consider them gatekeeping questions. And as indigenous academics, we might also want to be thinking about how we can uh, uh, clearly defend that knowledge and how we can um, present uh, the knowledge that, that we have uh, collected or that we that we have known even not even collected but in, in uh, the knowledge that we have known over time we have a role to play we have a role in the reimagining of what uh, the status of indigenous knowledges and indigenous languages uh, should look like <laughs>
Um, so our thinking as academics should be in terms of the knowledge production itself. Is there well-conducted research about the questions that ordinary people have been asking? And these are questions that uh, were asked by um, uh, uh, Kotsia uh, in, in 2018. Uh, these are also pro philosophical questions, but uh, they are questions that challenge us as Indigenous academics. And I am putting Indigenous there not because that's where uh, uh, Kotsia's thinking was. It was more in terms of who are we writing for? Uh, when we disseminate our research, uh, who are we actually writing for? Are we writing for the ordinary person in the street or we are writing for the two uh, or three academics who have specialized so much and they are the only ones who know what we are uh, working uh, in. So we, we need to draw in our, uh, our indigenous peoples into getting interested in, in the research that we are doing. And in terms of uh, dissemination, uh, have the findings of uh, this research been disseminated if we have conducted any research? And can indigenous people access it? And in terms of accessibility, I'm not just a, a think, I'm, I'm not thinking about, you know, do they have access to the library? It's also about the language that we are using. Are we writing to communicate to the ordinary person or are we at least separating our writing, the one that is for those super specialists and writing that uh, can be accessible uh, to uh, the person in the street so that people get empowered from the knowledge that we have. Um, uh, we, we often talk uh, with uh, uh, my uh, colleagues and sometimes with my children about how some general articles are not are not meant to be understood. You you just uh, need to know that this person is not written for you. You will not be able to understand what they have written, and that that is what we have to think about as a indigenous academics. Are we writing to communicate, or are we writing to? Uh, prevent people from even understanding what we what we are saying. Um, so if we given people the capacity to understand that knowledge and we need to think constantly what role is academic is academics we can play to ensure that there is epistemic justice in the accessibility to knowledge uh, out there. So um, it, it might not be fair for me to just be talking about uh, what should be uh, and not uh, providing uh, exemplars of uh, my own experience, how I think I might have contributed to the upholding of an indigenous uh, language and uh, making it valid. Uh, and I would, uh, maybe the, that would not be right to say I made it valid, but I just showcased the validity of a of an indigenous language so it was not my decision to make it valid it's valid already but uh, i showcased uh, that that kind of thing so i worked with a community in the role of kwazulu natal and part of my wonder uh, when when i had completed the research was how after uh, since 1652 the people in that community still speak Isizulu without an another word of English. And I'm those people are not illiterate, so don't get me wrong. They went to school, but they can still speak their language uh, properly as proper Zulu. And uh, language is a cultural and intellectual resource that they have which we can also draw on for in our sustainability uh, project. And the, the, I was amazed at the power of uh, the home language in the thought processes and ease of expression, the poems that just naturally come uh, from, you know, very small activities. And uh, already you find the students have 
such beautiful exp expressions that they had. So the, <coughs> sorry, the project that I was doing was um, meant to uh, contribute to culturally relevant education through documenting in the indigenous knowledge of the people of Mkacheni and uh, all the, the, the names and the pictures and everything that you may see, uh, it was all by agreement with the community. They didn't want to be uh, anonymous. Uh, and I was not reporting anything bad about them, so there was no need to protect them and valorize myself as, as the academic researcher. Uh, so uh, all the names and uh, there are no pseudonyms uh, used in, in, in that project because it was completely by agreement. And um, the second aim was also to contribute to the transformation of a uh, a indigenous knowledge research through using methods that value people's language and culture. And a, I, I used quite a lot of my own a, growing up in rural community, uh, communities to understand that if someone had to go to my village right now and a, start talking to the people in English, a, they would not have any participation from anyone not because no one is going to school, but because the, it's just disrespectful uh, to conduct, uh, to, to engage the community in a language that is not their own. So that was uh, what informed my uh, use uh, of the little Ndevele that I had learned in Zim uh, to use that uh, to try and communicate with the community in Isizulu. So that was how the research was de was designed. And in terms of uh, data generation, there was a wide range of activities that was involved, uh, numerous activities with students, uh, focus group discussions with uh, elders and uh, some individual interviews, and then a uh, formal and informal conversations with teachers and so on. And I had cultural guides because I knew I was coming in as an outsider and I needed people to assist uh, me, point me to what is culturally right and uh, what, what is not right. Because when we come from universities, we are armed with a university ethics clearance. And in my case, the university clearance a clearance and permission from the Department of Education in KZ10, uh, but I didn't just march into the community and show them my clearance letters and say, now I have come, uh, uh, you know. So I understood the, the cultural protocols that uh, also have, uh, uh, that are in place for a rural community. And all these things might not be written down yet, uh, for most of our communities, but they are there. There, there are rules, there are uh, things that you just don't do when you go into a rural community. So the language choices that I made um, were as follows. So using Isizulu, even to the point of reporting, uh, Starting the transcription of, of the uh, audio and video uh, data earlier in the process to allow for checking of meaning and unf unfamiliar expressions and so on. And doing all the analysis in the original language that the data was presented. That, this is very crucial because once you translate, uh, translation comes with its own um, issues. So I analyzed in the original language and uh, the translation was only done for those uh, extracts that I was including in the research report. Uh, and another thing that I would like to say also in, is in terms of transcription. Uh, so usually we ask someone to transcribe for us so for me, both because I didn't have a, a, a large enough amount of funding for that process, and also as a choice, 
it helped me to understand the, the the meaning of what the people were saying, understand the language even more when I was re- doing the, transcri- uh, the transcription for myself. So these are the language choices that I made uh, during that research. Uh, and from, <clears throat> I, I, I believe these findings are strongly related to the to the language choices that I made. Uh, I do think that I would not have understood as well uh, the depth uh, of uh, of the meaning of these findings if I uh, had not uh, chosen uh, to to proceed in terms of language the way that I proceeded. Um, so there was a strong sense of belonging to uh, to place. If there are any amongst uh, my audience who have a Zulu or um, a Zulu background, uh, they would uh, perhaps uh, understand when someone says in Kabayami ila you know, they are talking of their um, uh, umbilical cord. So it's it, because it's buried there in in their land. They they belong to the land is theirs. They they have a strong claim. To the land. Um, then there were the issues of spiritual connections, and these were more manifest in the students uh, because for the elders we had other things to talk about. But the students, in in most of the things that they uh, spoke about, uh, there was some connection they would make uh, to 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 their spirituality and uh, the role of ancestral spirits and how ancestral uh, spirits are, they are not viewed as dead people as, as such. It's almost once living or continuing to live kind of thing. Uh, and they still are presented as people with feelings and, and so on. Uh, like in the illustration that um, I, I have included here, uh, we were talking about the grass-thatched uh, huts, uh, which were in almost every homestead uh, in, in the community. And I was asking how, you know, what's the significance? Because e- even in the conversations with elders, there was also that issue about, uh, you know, we are losing the land. We now even can't find grass to thatch our huts and so on. And so I asked the students what what was the significance of those hearts? And uh, one of the students said, um, spoke about, uh, you know, housing uh, their ancestral spirits in the hearts because uh, otherwise uh, they, they would not be comfortable. Uh, like Amadlos, uh, means they will not be comfortable. Vayavati uh, Ayagodola. So it's almost like the, the ancestors will feel cold if they are in a in a modern uh, house. So that was the, the 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 some of the findings. Then the strong presence of the Zulu language uh, again, especially among the students. Uh, among the elders, we would uh, obviously just know that they are older, they have the language, but amongst the students, they would not mix up their languages. Um, and this expression that I have included here, um, the, the students were writing about their future. And this one student says, um, So that was the future does not belong to your uh, parents uh, because each frog must make its own leap. Uh, and I thought those were very strong expressions to be found amongst uh, teenagers uh, after so many centuries of colonization. And the way they saw reality in terms of uh, relationships, in, ter- in terms of collective responsibility, honesty, caring, and, and so on. And the names that are still prevalent there uh, reflect the, that strong inclination towards uh, relationships. Faneles Wong, Makawong, Wongani, Lungisani, Kolisile, and so on. All those. Uh, and if we look at some of our own names, uh, 
you know, you almost feel embarrassed that you have, a, you have an English name. You, you almost want to change your name to, to something else because uh, of the lack of meaning sometimes that our English names uh, do have. And uh, when we look at the extent of coloniality in terms of names, uh, like the country where I come from, you know, people have words, English words that don't mean anything when they are beautiful, Shonan, Debele, Kalanga, Tonga, or other language names that they could be using, uh, but they prefer to use, uh, you know, some random word uh, uh, as a name. Uh, sorry, I think I went back to, oh, okay. All right. So, consider this complicated history. Uh, how do we then counter perce perceptions of research as, advanced, uh, as advancing a, col a, a, a colonial agenda? Because that is where we are coming from. The research that used to happen uh, was not meant for, uh, for an indigenous perspective. It was someone comes in, they spend two minutes in, in your community and already they have made conclusions about what life is like for you and they write about you. Uh, how can we do research in, in a way that does not show that kind of perspective? Uh, how do we refute the myth that research and research methods are culture free? Because they are not. Uh, my own research was a uh, full of my own cultural uh, upbringing and I, I used that a lot. I used that in my uh, making of meaning uh, in the interpretation of uh, what the, the, uh, the community participants were saying. Uh, so research is not culture free. We cannot be objective and stand there thinking we are generating some neutral uh, knowledge. There is nothing called neutral even from Western knowledge. It's full of the culture of uh, the researcher. Um, how do we acknowledge that our understanding and interpretation of reality takes the shape of our own cultural landscape? Um, uh, how do we become more respectful and more ethical throughout the research process? not only in what we tell the ethics committee, but we make these ethics decisions through and through uh, from the time we enter the community to the time of our reporting. Uh, how do we transform even the, um, the ethics reviews uh, from cultural bias to become more compatible uh, you know, with the reality of indigenous peoples? Uh, all those are questions that we need to be thinking about. And, and so I, I would like to propose a community-centered uh, research framework uh, and can be applied even in terms of education for communities uh, where their way of life is uh, very much divorced from a Western uh, way of life. Um, so. Uh, we, the, the underpinnings of this uh, community-centered research uh, uh, framework would be from a perspective that certainly all knowledge is situated. Uh, it depends on the context, the realities that go on in a particular place and the culture that is dominant in that particular place are very important. Uh, and culture and language cannot be divorced there. Uh, the knowledge is always connected to the noah. Uh, they, there is no way in which the noah can distance themselves and view knowledge uh, as an, you know, as a distant object uh, from an objective uh, point of view. Uh, and we need also to be thinking that culture is a live and dynamic a concept because when we think indigenous knowledge is, uh, in most cases, uh, people are thinking the Iron Age or the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages, or uh, but culture is dynamic. So there is a perspective of indigenous knowledge or, or an aspect of indigenous knowledge, which is certainly uh, earlier than now. Uh, 
but there is also an aspect of indigenous knowledge which is intergenerational so those things that we pass from one generation to the other and there is a, a growth in a indigenous knowledge which comes from normal interface with other cultures so even prior to the uh, coming of uh, colonialism uh, there was also always that interface of uh, of cultures and the dynamism uh, where uh, you hear what other how other people do certain things and you also change your way of doing things so let's look at indigenous knowledge also having that dynamism in it so we are not just looking at ancient things we are looking at things that have happened over time um, and knowledge is embedded in culture and language we can't talk of knowledge apart from culture and language uh, we can only talk of the validity of indigenous knowledges if we are also talking at the same time the validity of indigenous languages because language is the vehicle uh, of knowledge transmission and uh, language also provides that sense of identity uh, so we, we cannot uh, think uh, of them as separated. And we also need to think of that knowledge, that indigenous knowledge as diverse. Uh, so what I got uh, or what I found out in the community in um, that I worked in, in KwaZulu-Natal uh, is not generalizable to the wall of KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, it will not be generalizable to the situation in Limpopo or in Zimbabwe. Let's also know that this indigenous knowledge is diverse and it, it's contextual. And uh, when we look at it from that way, then whenever we get into a community to do research with them, we are thinking about our, do I speak? the language, how am I going to negotiate the language space? How am I going to enhance collaboration with the community uh, so that the communities are not just the recipients of our knowledge? We are not going there from an arrogant, know it all perspective, but we are going in there as those that are willing to learn from the community and those that are also willing to contribute something to the community. How do we make those re relationships respectful um, so that we, we don't present ourselves as a, in, in arrogance, as I have said already, and then the role of elders. So these are not just elders in terms of age, but they are sometimes also elders in terms of their role uh, or elders in terms of the knowledge that they have. So elders, the definition there is um, can, can differ. Um, how do we share the benefits? Uh, in my situation, um, uh, there were plans uh, and uh, those, uh, those that might uh, have the time to read my thesis, uh, they know the, the plans that were there to share the benefits uh, with the community, which did not uh, materialize at, uh, at some point, but uh, because of other reasons, but there were clear plans. And during the process, we were sharing benefits. Uh, if they needed resources from my side, I would look for resources and uh, help them in ways that uh, I could uh, as a community. Um, the importance of place, the importance of understanding community perspectives. We spoke about cultural protocols earlier that even when they are not written, it doesn't mean they don't exist. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, that is uh, what I am proposing. When we are going into a community, we need to be thinking about all these things, even in terms of uh, education at a local level. Is this relevant? Uh, we need to be thinking about that. So how then do we look at a situation of sustainability? Uh, from a United Nations point of view, there is a, a recognition of all indigenous peoples, but uh, obviously uh, there are many questions about the uh, United Nations, whether uh, 
as a body, they are doing their work or achieving their objectives and, and stuff like that. But that is a declaration. And as indigenous peoples, we also need to be at the forefront of uh, recognizing all indigenous uh, languages. And we need to revisit our blind spots on, uh, on notions of tribal superiority. Uh, and this is a more common, I think, where I come from, uh, more than in South Africa, I think. But I think they, they could be a, a stuff like that also here, where simply because you speak a language A, so you see yourself as better than someone who speaks language B. We, we need to be thinking around that if we are to think about sustainability. And um, borrowing from uh, someone in, in the, from, uh, from the, the, the Arctic uh, Indigenous Language Symposium, uh, I think uh, the pronunciation could be Pe Langad. Uh, they said languages grow from use and they feed on use and die from lack of use. So as an indigenous person, I need to be thinking about, you know, who is causing the death of my language? Is it someone from the outside or it's from myself because I'm not wanting to use my own language? Uh, we can tag onto technology and media uh, and also learn from other indigenous uh, peoples. Uh, considering sustainability and taking that conversation forward, uh, I have my own regrets. My grandmother, who is not the one shown in this picture, I wish I had uh, done that. My grandmother used to make clay pots and uh, beautiful, beautiful clay pots, but we didn't have cameras also during a time. Uh, but I could have perhaps uh, recorded, uh, you know, have her explain her skill, how she does uh, all that she does until it comes to a clay pot. Uh, but I, I didn't do that at that time because most of our knowledge uh, is oral and we need now to begin to write up those knowledges. That's why I'm saying here our gun is now the pen. We, we need to document. Uh, we need to tell our own stories, not allow other people or give space for other people to come and tell our stories on our behalf. We need to tell our own stories. So writing has to happen and take a community-centered approach, um, but that requires patience and humility and openness to learn. And in terms of research, it's, it's also very difficult because the issues of funding uh, our universities sometimes are not willing to fund long-term research. They are not willing to uh, fund a research that does uh, that that happens at a long distance. In my own case, when I had issues with funding at the beginning of my PhD journey, uh, one of the seniors in the in our school uh, at that time said, "Just just go to Soweto. You can do the same research in Soweto." But I I. I didn't think so. It was a uh, rich enough in terms of a uh, uh, indigenous knowledge, and uh, so there is that issue of funding also. And uh, we need to shift away from a uh, expropriation and going with a deficit perspective. That this community does not have this. This community does not have that. Uh, what do they have? That which they have is very important. Uh, for their uh, for their sustainability, and uh, so lastly, uh, I see our um, I see the issue of sustainability of uh, our knowledges and epistemologies is uh, something that we all have a role to play. Uh, so starting from the individual researcher. Uh, I'm supposing that the individual researcher is perhaps an indigenous researcher, but they might not be. But the indigenous research community have a role to play in uh, making sure that they keep that researcher accountable and that they peer review their work and uh, all that. Is this uh, relevant uh, for the community? Is this helpful? And, and so on. And uh, the indigenous community with which that researcher is doing research, 
uh, must also stamp their foot about uh, their protocols. This is not the way you approach our community. We want you to speak in this language. Uh, we didn't understand what you said. What does this question mean? Uh, what you are wanting to research is not part of our priorities and, and so on. Um, so that also make, uh, keeps the, the researcher accountable. And the other stakeholders, I'm looking at government and uh, other communities and so on, uh, they also have their own uh, part to play uh, in terms of recognizing languages, recog uh, advocacy and, and, and so on. So we all have a part to play. We can't play that part on our own, uh, but we can contribute uh, somewhat. It would be best if we all came together, contributed together, and uh, do the best we can for for the sustainability of our uh, indigenous languages. Thank you.